Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Ariel Moyal. Um, I work with Environment Massachusetts Research and Policy Center, and we are here today to release our 100% renewable energy agenda and also to celebrate local clean energy leadership around um, Fall River and specifically at the Bristol Community College and this beautiful building. Um, I'm joined today by Steve Kenyon, Paul Vigent, and um, Kathy Driscoll. And now I will turn it over to Ben Hellerstein, the State Director of Environment Massachusetts Research and Policy Center, for a few remarks outlining the recommendations that we have in the agenda and what it means for the prospect of clean energy. After that, I'll turn it over to our other speakers for brief comments, and then we will take um, a tour with Steve um, of uh, the Sprega Health and Sciences Building. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ariel. So uh, my name is Ben Hellerstein, and I'm the State Director for the Environment Massachusetts Research and Policy Center. Uh, I wanted to start by just saying a big thank you to the team at, at Bristol Community College for hosting us today. Um, I think this building is, in many ways, um, the perfect example of the 100% renewable energy future uh, that we're all trying to create in Massachusetts. And um, our hope is that uh, other colleges, other institutions, uh, businesses, municipal governments, even uh, private individuals will look to the example of this building uh, and try to replicate it in communities across the state. So I'm excited to be here, excited to um, help shine a spotlight on the great work going on here on campus, um, as well as throughout the South Coast region on, on renewable energy. So um, we're here today to talk about our 100% renewable energy agenda. And um, this is a set of bold policy recommendations uh, for Massachusetts top officials, including the winner of this fall's gubernatorial election, uh, to accelerate our transition to 100% clean renewable energy across all sectors of our economy. And our message today is that for decades, Massachusetts has been a leader in preserving our environment, in protecting public health, and in reducing global warming pollution. Today, our leadership is needed more than ever. And with the recommendations in this document, Massachusetts can lead the nation and the world uh, towards a future where all of our energy is coming from clean, limitless, pollution-free sources. We've seen tremendous progress in renewable energy in Massachusetts in the last few years. Uh, today, we have more than 240 times as much solar power generated in Massachusetts as we did just 10 years ago. Uh, we're poised to see similar progress on offshore wind, in large part thanks to the work of uh, institutions and, and uh, civic leaders here in the South Coast that have really pushed for it. Um, and for all the progress we've made so far, there's so much more that we can do. Uh, offshore wind alone could provide 19 times as much electricity as the entire state of Massachusetts consumes each year. And um, even with solar power, even if all we did was just put solar panels on every roof in the state that was facing the right direction and wasn't shaded by a tree or by another building, um, we could generate 47% of our electricity just from rooftop solar alone. So the potential is enormous, and uh, new technologies ranging from electric vehicles to energy storage to air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps will enable us to power all of our lives, including our electricity, um, to, to heat and cool our buildings, to move our transportation system entirely with renewable energy at all times of the day and night. Um, right now up at the State House, uh, state officials have some important decisions to make. Uh, our legislative session is drawing to a close on July 31st, and there are a number of key clean energy policies that are currently pending. Um, back in June, the Massachusetts Senate passed a bill that would get us to 50% renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% renewable electricity by 2050 and also uh, set a higher benchmark for uh, offshore wind development in the coming years and uh, eliminate the caps on solar net metering. And as folks may know, these caps are already holding back solar uh, investment in hundreds of communities across the state. Um, the House has also passed a clean energy bill, although less uh, ambitious and less comprehensive in scope. Um, and legislators have uh, just a week until July 31st to come to an agreement. Um, and uh, we're urging them to move quickly on these issues because um, the problems we're facing, whether from climate change or from health harming pollution, are urgent. And uh, we can't afford to wait, particularly when it comes to solar power that's already been held up for, for such a long time. 
Um, looking beyond the 31st, going into the fall and into the next year, um, whoever it is that wins our gubernatorial election has a huge opportunity to move Massachusetts forward. And I think we're lucky in Massachusetts that we have a bipartisan history of clean energy leadership. Both Democrats and Republicans have taken uh, big steps forward. And um, we hope that uh, by embracing this agenda, um, we can really keep Massachusetts at the forefront of these changes. And we know that um, the rest of the nation is looking to us to lead the way forward. And there are all sorts of advantages that come from us being a, a first mover and being at the forefront front of making these changes. So uh, to conclude, uh, now is the time for Massachusetts to go big on clean energy. Uh, and if we implement the recommendations in this agenda, we can have healthier communities today and a safer future for our children and more prosperous and uh, stronger communities. So uh, I want to again thank Bristol Community College for hosting us today. And uh, we're excited to hear from our other speakers and, and learn more about the uh, really tremendous clean energy leadership that's been going on in this region. So thank you. Thanks, Ben. So I appreciate the opportunity this morning just to talk a little bit about the accomplishments from uh, Bristol Community College, both in the facilities realm, but also the uh, academic realm. So, you know, we pride ourselves on having been at the forefront of sustainability efforts and educational off offerings in the Commonwealth um, from our significant reliance now on solar for our electric to the building you know, that we're in right now, it's a perfect example, as, as Ben had said. The John J. Sprague Health and Science Building was completed in 2016. It's just under 50,000 square feet in size, and it's a LEED Platinum rated building. And it's the largest zero net energy classroom and science lab building in the state. So there are other larger buildings, but the science lab make it particularly challenging from a design perspective to achieve uh, zero net energy. So this building allows the, the college to operate at 100% on um, energy that's created on site. So that's you know, the whole concept behind it, which is remarkable. And part of that is out here to the east, there are 30 500 foot geothermal wells that help keep the, help us heat it and cool the building because of the constant water temperature at 500 feet, so about 55 degrees. So it helps us save energy and, and money both in the heating season and the cooling season. And this building, I would need uh, college communications to help me. It has won so many awards uh, nationally, um, internationally, through the state. It's too numerous to, to count. And also, it would. I'd be remiss if I didn't say how many state agencies that it took to make this happen, from the Department of Energy Resources to the governor's office. It wouldn't have happened without a lot of people who are like-minded, and, and we're very grateful to all of them. We received over a million dollars just from DOER to help subsidize the cost of the um, photovoltaic panels and the carport and the geothermal that helps make this uh, building run. And an interesting fact about the building, which I think we're most proud of, is that you know, we received a budget from the state to build the building, which we desperately needed. And it wasn't until after we had that budget that we decide, decided to make it zero net energy. And I think that's what was most re remarkable, that we did it within the budget that we were given to build a traditional building. And that's why it won so many awards around the country, and that's why this example has really taken off, you know, with other, specifically colleges and universities, but it certainly can be replicated in business and industry as well. And prior to this building was the carport system that I, I hope you saw when you came in. That's a 3.2 megawatt carport uh, photovoltaic system. It covers 800 parking spots over five acres. I know at the time of construction, it was the largest one in, in the Commonwealth. Um, I'm not sure if it still is. But that provides over 50% of the electric that the college consumes in a year. And in the summer months, it, it does literally over 100% to the point where we're getting a credit on our energy bill, which is in July and August. I'm sure you can appreciate that's a good feeling. So 
it saves about eighty to ninety thousand dollars annually based on the rates we're paying for that energy that's being produced versus through fossil fuels and but the best part is that it's coming from a renewable resource and uh, some of the energy conservation other energy conservation me measures on campus are that we have a small turbine it's a six kilowatt turbine on the east side of campus and that's used for primarily training and education but it is tied into the college's grid um, we also do numerous on-site recycling and, and composting and i could go on we have we do a ton of energy conservation measures here at the college but as in, important as that is i think it's equally or more important about some of the educational programs that we have here at the college which i, I think you know to some of ben's points you know we need to train people to work in the industries that you know paul's going to speak to about wind in a few minutes and you know we have an engineering technology with an offshore wind power technology concentration that prepares students to work as technicians for the offshore uh, wind power industry. Uh, we have a, the Blue Center for Water Technologies, which was established in response to the growing need for drinking water and wastewater industry technicians. And we have a sustainable agricultural program that prepares students for careers in agriculture, environmental protection, and, and community development. And that Curriculum includes food systems, local and global sustainability, environmental science, public policy, how to grow uh, food organically. So it's definitely not all about the, the renewables, but there's so much more I think we can educate our students on. Um, we've got the, a sustainable studies program that provides an entry into societal changes and opportunities offered by climate change, resource consumption, and, and energy use. And we also have an environmental science transfer program, prepares students in the areas of biological, chemical, and physical processes of the earth and our relationship to them. So these are just a, a sample of some of the educational programs that we have. And, and I, obviously I talked about some of the facility accomplishments that Bristol has achieved. And you know, I'm just very proud of uh, what this college has done, and, and I hope that we're a role model for other colleges and universities around the country. So thank you. Paul? Uh, good morning. I'm Paul Vigian. I work as the managing director of the New Bedford Wind Energy Center, and I want to commend uh, Ben and his team for putting forward a, an aggressive uh, environmental agenda. Uh, I think we all feel better just intuitively when uh, we can live our normal post-industrial life and not adversely affect the planet, as has been the case for the last 200 years. So kudos to, to you, Ben, and to your team for bringing that forward. Um, I want to just connect a couple of dots, too. Steve's story just described how a goal of 100% renewable is not sort of a pie-in-the-sky thing, because this campus is living evidence that companies communities, and all of us as individual citizens can achieve and aspire to that goal of 100% renewable. Uh, what excites me the most, obviously, in my current role is the stat that Ben just kind of whipped out there, that this offshore wind resource off the coast of Massachusetts has the capacity to generate 19 times the electrical demand in Massachusetts. That's a big deal. And I think the study goes on further to say if, if you converted every house to electric energy and every car to electric, you'd still have four times the supply, uh, four times the demand to power all of Massachusetts from a 100% green source, and in that case, specifically offshore wind. I know it's still a little bit of a sleeper. Um, it's hard to recognize that the offshore wind industry is nothing less than a new base industry for the entire country. It's a new way to produce electricity. Uh, I think the data is something like with conventional power plants, whether they're nuclear, coal, or gas-fired power plants, 70% of the operating expense associated with a power plant is fuel, right? And in those cases, carbon-based fuels and certainly nuclear fuels 
have a, a high risk element when you're thinking about environmental preservation. Uh, in offshore wind, the fuel cost is zero. So for New Bedford, it's kind of like having gone full circle, right? In the, in the 1700s and 1800s, when whaling dominated not only the sea, but the energy power business, right? You, you, you lit lamps with uh, whale oil. It, was, it, re, it really made New Bedford the epicenter of the world energy uh, marketplace. The tragedy about that strategy is that it was unsustainable, right? I mean, sooner or later, you kill off all the whales, and then you're out of whale oil. So the beauty of offshore wind is its sustainable nature. And for those of you who don't realize it, I, I've referred to the Massachusetts offshore wind area. There's a wind, when you're at the beach at Horse Neck, and you're looking out, you're never going to see these things because they're far enough out that they're beyond the curvature of the Earth. But just beyond the curvature of the Earth, about 14, 15 miles south of uh, Gay Head, is an energy zone unique to North America that in the past I've referred to either as the Saudi Arabia of wind, or now my newer cliche is the Starbucks corner, <laughs> right? Starbucks wants to be on that corner, not on that corner, because that's where the action is. And in this case, that wind zone in North America is just one of these earth things. It's where, and for those of you who watch the weather, you know what happens when a hurricane comes, right? It kind of falls the east coast, and then it starts spinning south of Nantucket, and then it decides either to smash into the continent or it gets bumped out to sea by the jet stream, right? So you just get these two earth things, the Gulf Stream and the northern jet stream that collide every day 15 miles off our coast, and it creates the Starbucks corner for wind. It creates a wind zone that has the capacity to generate 18 times our electricity consumption. And when you look at an image of the North American continent at night, it's very stark to see this strip of electricity from Boston to Washington. I mean, it, it's the dominant factor, the dominant feature of North America at night. And to think that just 20, 30 miles off our coast is a continental shelf that allows us to deploy technology that's already in use in Europe to build skyscraper-like windmills. You know, you see a little baby puppy out here. It's a good teaching tool, and it contributes. Or if you drive by and you see the Phillips Lydalier Tower, if you're in Fairhaven, you see the three windmills. You, you're in Portsmouth. You go by and you see a windmill on land, you say, that thing's pretty big, but I want to give you a sense of scale. The, the devices that they're putting in the ocean are closer in height to the John Hancock Tower and the Prudential Tower in Boston than anything you see here. And in fact, I've got an image in one of my presentations where if you took just the three blades from a six megawatt machine, which is what they have installed off of Block Island, it would not fit in Fenway Park. So these are big devices, and they through scale the energy companies in Europe have been able to get the price down from in the mid-20s to single digits. The last unsubsidized project in Sweden came in at five cents a megawatt hour. Right? That's half what we pay now for retail. So I just want to suggest that being 100% renewable is not a pipe dream. It's a reality. And it's a near-term reality for Massachusetts. So I think this agenda, I think, advances that. I would encourage the legislature to continue to pursue this idea with one caveat. We need to share the sea. And our economy, particularly the economy in New Bedford, has really been driven for hundreds of years by the fishing industry. So we have to be mindful that when we put these devices in the ocean, we have to engage a multitude of stakeholders, not the least of whom is the fishing industry, because it's a net, it's a, it's a zero-sum game if we create 10,000 jobs in offshore wind and end up bumping 10,000 fishermen out of work, right? So what we really need to do is create 10,000 jobs in wind and maintain 10,000 jobs in fishing, and we can do that through good planning. So congratulations, Ben. Nice work. Good morning. I'm Kathy Driscoll from Massachusetts Maritime Academy. I'm the Environmental Health Safety and Sustainability Officer on uh, campus. 
uh, the, the Academy has been involved in energy operations for about two decades, um, whether this was energy efficiency, upgrades, um, a lot of the low-hanging fruit that we've spoken about um, over the years, and we've been able to expand um, into various types of energy systems um, that have conserved energy, reduced our cost, and most important, provided the educational insights to those different energy systems. We've expanded the energy, uh, renewable energy program at the Academy uh, that has allowed us to eliminate heating oil on campus. We have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by over 30 million pounds in the last 10 years. And all of those are helping us create a community not just on uh, campus or within Buzzards Bay, but in the South Coast and across the Commonwealth, uh, to show that these systems, whether through a balanced portfolio or even into uh, burgeoning into greater uh, amounts of renewable, that they work. We first forayed into renewable energy back in 2005, 2006 with our wind turbine. Uh, it's a 660 kilowatt Vestas wind turbine. Uh, no longer manufactured anymore, but I guess there are some that you can refurbish. Um, but it has been a wonderful tool, not only for generating electricity that we use on campus, but as an educational insight about how wind works not only how it works as a function, but how it works in generating electricity with other systems. From wind turbine, we went into solar. We have solar arrays, we have solar pathway lighting, solar thermal, geothermal, and we're researching hydrokinetic energy on the Cape Cod Canal. With hydrokinetic energy, we're hoping to work with public-private partnerships. What types of turbines can we use in the water? Uh, we're also doing this with higher education institutes. Um, how can we maximize the output of electricity with minimizing the impact on the marine environment? We're very sensitive to what we do um, in terms of affecting uh, the marine ec uh, ecology. We're surrounded on water at three sides at Mass Maritime, so what we do on the water is very, very important to us. With all of these systems on campus, we have been able to achieve greater than 50% renewable energy for our energy needs. Uh, that also includes some agreements with off-site solar farms, um, uh, particularly in Mattapoiset. Uh, we look at opportunities to be able to support those community solar programs. Uh, it's also for communities to be able to lower the prices uh, for municipalities to purchase electricity from those farms, as well as for us to be able to lower our carbon footprint. Uh, our buildings are also highly energy efficient. We have new and renovated buildings on our campus. Most of the campus was built back in the early 70s, and we have been able to upgrade our dormitories, uh, a former library into academic space, and with our newest building, the ABS Information Commons, which is academic and library space, which actually achieved the first state higher education institute, uh, higher education um, building for LEED Platinum. Uh, it, models at about 50% more efficient than a standard academic building. And our students are in love with the building. We used to have operating hours of about eight to seven every day, and now we're open until 11 o'clock at night for the students to be in there working, studying, research, um, and just meeting together in their difficult um, academic paths. But we're not done yet. We're looking into solar canopies with battery storage in the new SMART program. Uh, we have a very large parking lot right in front of our gymnasium building that I hope to be able to put uh, about a one megawatt canopy as well as lining uh, along the, uh, the athletic fields with coverage for our sidewalk and improved lighting on the campus. Um, that will also help to minimize any lighting pollution over to the canal. Again, protecting our marine environment without any artificial light. <clears throat> and then also for fuel cells and microgrid um, on campus to help us improve our resiliency. Um, we are at 
sea level with our campus. Uh, we have no basements in any of our buildings, but we do have areas which could be prone to flooding, um, which hasn't happened in 27 years. <laughs> Um, but it's always important for us to um, be prepared and to create those systems where if we do lose power from an outside source that we have the ability to provide a resource and an area for our students, faculty, staff, anyone that is there and working and needing to provide services on campus. Resiliency has really become the next level of concentration for us on campus. Our student complement is growing. It's, um, we're very proud of what we have done to grow the academy, not only in renewable energy and energy efficiency and reduction in greenhouse ca uh, gas emissions, but what we provide to the next generation of students and uh, entrepreneurs um, and business with the, uh, our programs. In the last 10 years, uh, we've doubled our student population and we've also increased our bachelor degree program with seven disciplines. Uh, our newest is energy systems engineering, where our students are learning about going out and running buildings more efficiently, creating those new energy systems, new designs, innovation that will take us to the next level of uh, energy independence. And then we also have four graduate degree programs, uh, one with a concentration in facilities management. Our partnerships with other state institutions is highly important, not only with Bristol Community College and other community colleges, but across the state. They are indicating our need and our desire to grow the, in, uh, the industry and to support renewable energy. Uh, they're going to help us expand and provide those opportunities, the jobs, the viable nature, the incomes that we're going to be need going into the future and making and continuing to have Massachusetts be the stronghold and the leader in the renewable energy field. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers that shared um, the great work that they are doing today. As you've heard, we've built a good foundation here in Massachusetts, especially when it comes to solar and energy efficiency. But for all the work that we have done, there is so much progress. Um, there's so much more that we can do. So as Ben talked about, now is the time to go big on clean energy. And we believe that the 100% renewable energy agenda that um, was detailed today sets out a clear roadmap to do just that. 